officially good morning everyone for another five minutes then it will be afternoon i'm lynn snodgrass the ceo of the best darn chamber in the pacific northwest don't tell bpa or hillsborough or anybody else but i am and you are so i want to thank our presenting sponsors right now our presenting sponsors of portland general electric Dean Funk, thank you so much for um, your sponsorship of this event. And Columbia Bank, Robin couldn't be with us today, but Columbia Bank, uh, we're fortunate to have them as sponsors. And they provide the little couches, and Dean wanted to kind of curl up in the one in the back there, so don't get in his way. So. Uh, I also want to thank our stakeholder sponsors, Gresham Barlow School District with Dr. Pereira. Metro East Community Media is a sponsor as well. They are our community, our media sponsor. And there's replay schedules on the registration desk. On your way out, be sure and take one so that you can hear Lynn Peterson again and again and again. Um, it'll be very important today. I'd also like, at this point in time, to recognize our elected officials today. And we almost have a quorum. Uh, we don't, but that's very important to never have a quorum. So I'd like to um, thank President, is it President or Council Chair? Uh, City Council President. City Council President Jerry Hinton is here. Thank you for coming, Jerry. We appreciate you. Applause, applause, applause. Thank you. And Councillor Carolyn Eccles and Councillor David Widmark are also here today. Thank you both, too. Now I'd like to recognize the board members that are here today. And I'm going to announce first the president of the Gresham Chamber, Jim Hathaway. Jim, thank you very much for being here as the president. And Dean Funk of PGE is on our board. Dean, again. Um, and thank you for a wonderful host uh, event on Sunday. I got to see a Timbers game through Dean's eyes, and it was so fun. It was really fun. It was a date. My husband's counting it as a date, even though he had nothing to do with it. But he's counting it as a date. And oh, yes, da yes, clap for. I thought you were going to clap for my husband, and you shouldn't do that. So. And then uh, from Warren Allen, LLP, we've got Warner Allen, and you're going to hear from him in just a minute. I was trying to think of a funny story today. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, applause, applause, applause. You didn't promote that one. Um, I was trying to think of a fun story to tell you um, to get the, roll, the ball rolling today. And the last time that Chair Peterson was here, I shared the elephant story about how Metro started in my memory. So I didn't think it appropriate to bring up elephant poop again. So I'm not going to do that. And my grandchildren have been really good. So I, had, I don't have any story to tell you. And the bear is not there. So that's the end of my intro, except for the fact that there are orange napkins on the table on purpose. Who knows why? Where's the black? Where's the black? That's what's been happening is a lot of darkness on the weekend. So, so um, it's okay to come in second place uh, over and over and over again, but we hope that they don't. I'm, I'm talking Beavers football. Uh, so anyway, all right, with that, Warner, I'm going to invite you up to introduce our speaker today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Lynn has to say. Well, and so am I. Uh, Lynn Peterson was raised in Wisconsin by a family of educators who taught her the values of public service and community. These values of respecting the land and all who inhabit it have guided the work that she has done as a nationally recognized expert in transportation and land use. Lynn has worked at the local, state, and national levels for the last 30 years delivering outcomes on affordable housing, transportation investment, and minority contracting. Len served as secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation with responsibility for the state's highways, bridges, railways, and ferry system, and is now an advisor to transportation departments across the country. Previously, she served as Oregon Governor Kitzhopper's transportation policy, easy for me to say, advisor, where she directed transportation energy policy statewide transportation funding decisions, and the implementation of community priorities. In 2008, she became the first elected chair of the Clackamas County Commission. Lynn holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and two master's degrees from Portland State University in Civil and Environmental Engineering, and in Urban and Regional Planning. 
Her past prepared her for her elected role today. Please welcome the chair of Metro Council, Lynn Peterson. Thank you. So the official title is President of the Metro Council, and I like to say somebody had to be Madam President. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much for having me today. I was trying to remember when I was here last, Lynn, um, and it was before, I, I think before I was even elected. And so it's been actually a year and a half, two years, and I wanted to come and update you uh, of where Metro has been over the last uh, nine months uh, since we have our, our new council with um, the youngest, the youngest uh, person ever elected to the Metro Council, Juan Carlos Gonzalez from Washington County, um, the first uh, Latina, like Latina, Latino, um, who is ever elected, and also a new member from uh, uh, Clackamas County, Christine Lewis, who had uh, spent some time in this region working as a campaign consultant and also uh, as a lobbyist and for Bully. Um, and so we have a lot of new expertise on the council, along with the expertise that we have from this district right here uh, with uh, Shirley Craddock. Um, I am so pleased to serve with Shirley after all these years having uh, been uh, working with her on, on issues around the region when I was at Clackamas County in the governor's office. So you have a great representative, and uh, she, she keeps us all uh, uh, grounded, I think, in uh, not just reality, but in, in what's good for us, because she is a nutritionist, right? <laughs> so she spends a lot of time helping us with that. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and go over where we are in the regional investment strategies. These are three big lifts that the region asked Metro to take on, and we are in the middle of implementing many of them and about to implement um, the big one, which is the last one, which is transportation. So I wanted to let you know where we're at and how your tax dollars are being used, what we said we were gonna do, and where, where we're at and how we're gonna make sure that we carry that out. I think all of you recognize that uh, since 1980, we have doubled in population in this region. We are, have obviously, in the last five to six years, experienced extreme growth, and we have two issues that have risen to the fore, and that are affordable housing, the lack of affordable housing in this region, and transportation congestion, uh, just basic can't get around anymore, accessibility um, and affordability just of transportation. So uh, when I came on to the Metro Council, we had just passed the first ever nationwide regional affordable housing bond measure. And that is a big deal, that's 700, $675 million that is being spent uh, in the seven areas of, uh, uh, of this region where we have three housing authorities at the, at the county level, Washington County, Clackamas County, and Multnomah County. And then we have four cities, including Gresham, which have the ability to do affordable housing. And so they're all starting to rock and roll on getting the units out the door. And what do I mean by that? We passed it in November, and we worked with all of our jurisdictions on uh, intergovernmental agreements because we are new players into this arena. Metro is a new player into this arena, and we had to establish with our partners how that money would be used and how we would provide the oversight to make sure that we got out the door the 3,900 units through those seven different jurisdictions that were promised that we would build with that money. Those 3,900 units are to serve 12,000 people in the first uh, wave of folks. Obviously, those folks only stay there until they're stabilized, and then they moved, move on. About half of the money is for very, very, very low-income people, and usually those are the folks just coming off the street, and the other half is for low-income families. So we, we are looking to build both in the region. What I can tell you is that Metro has approved, upon request of those jurisdictions, 300 and 339 units to date. Um, so those units will go into construction within the next year, and we, will, we continue to take in new requests for new projects from all seven of those jurisdictions, and we've uh, got all of the IGAs done, so we're, we're well on our way. Um, uh, they, they still have yet to be adopted by the Metro Council, uh, technically, but they are all underway, which is great. 
But that, that's just the first issue, right? That was the top issue. When you poll anybody in this region, affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing, they're all very worried because they all know somebody, every single one of you knows somebody who's, who has had to move away, who has had to go in and live with somebody else, or who just can't afford to live here at all and has um, had to leave the region completely. What I can tell you is that uh, we intend to keep going with in this direction to make sure that we continue to get market rate housing out as well as low income affordable housing because those are two separate things. Uh, we need to get all of that out because the only thing that this region has too much of is what? Luxury condos in downtown. <laughs> we have too many of those. Every other part of the market, we do not, we cannot meet the demand. So that means that we've got a lot of folks moving out into Canby, into uh, Cascade Locks and Hood River, into uh, St. Helens, and that's been driving up the congestion more than anything else, more than the new people coming, right? Because that means more people driving longer distances, taking up more time on the same roads. So th that was the first lift we made, but the other two were already in the works when I got to Metro, and that was the Regional Parks and Open Space Bond Measure, which is out on the street now, which I'll talk about, and then finally transportation for November of 2020. So the one that we've got out right now, Parks and Open Spaces, is our third Regional Parks and Open Space Bond Measure over the last 15 years. In that time, we have purchased 17,000 acres of land, some of which are right around this area that uh, Councillor Craddock likes to talk about, um, that have been set aside. And m m the majority of the work that's been done with that, those monies uh, from the past two bond measures actually went outside the urban growth boundary in terms of the purchase of land. So 17,000 acres total purchased, 11,500 of them are outside the urban growth boundary. And you're gonna say, why? Why, Lynn? Well, for several different reasons. The first being that no city is gonna be able to have the ability to go and buy up land outside their city like you at the edge in Gresham, in anticipation of growth. But Metro can. Metro should be doing that. We should be making sure that the land that, that needs to be preserved, that's highest for habitat and for clean, clean water, and making sure that we preserve stream corridors so we keep those salmon in those rivers, that, that is our goal. That's the first thing. The second is uh, that we, we need to make sure that, um, well, a, as we grow, that we're able to do that. The, the work that we've done, though, on the bond measure has four programs to it, and this year we added two new ones. But let's talk about those first, the four programs. The first one in the bond measure from the last uh, two that will continue, all four of these, uh, is that we will be buying up more land because we can never preserve enough land as we grow and we need more parks inside our urban growth boundary as we densify. So we'll be doing that. Second, we'll be able to put a lot more capital improvement into two parks that were created this whole system, which are Blue Lake and Oxbow. They both need major overhauls. And this bond measure specifically on the capital side is heavily weighted towards those two parks, both in your backyard. The third part of that program, and I'll see the city council smile when I say, the city councilors smile when I say this, is the local share. The money that goes directly to the cities and the counties for them to be able to purchase or make capital improvements in their own, their own parks. The fourth, which I think might be the single most um, uh, touted small grant program in the region is our Nature in the Neighborhoods program, where any neighborhood, any nonprofit that wants to work on getting access to nature, making sure that they're cleaning up some part of their neighborhood, you can apply for a Nature in the Neighborhood grant and you will probably get it. So I know kids who have applied and gotten it to roll up, roll up concrete uh, pavement in their area and put down a new park. It was it instigated all of that to wayfinding to a Nature in the Neighborhood grant that went along with the light rail station at the end of um, the the Max train to or uh, to um, 
to Milwaukee. So there was a, a lot of work to restore the habitat by the neighborhood next to the park and ride. That's what they wanted to do, and that's where we found the money, and that they found the money to do it. So those are the four mainstay programs, and they're still there. The, second, the, the fifth program that we added is that we pulled out and created uh, a new program just for trails. And the reason for that is we were implicitly working with jurisdictions on trails, but we wanted to tout it and we wanted to make it a priority. Um, so we have $40 million in this bond measure, and I'll get to how much it is and where it's coming from. Um, uh, for trails, the sixth program that we created really rose out of this idea of setting aside money for the Willamette Falls access. And a lot of you are shaking your heads. Uh, I hope that you have the chance in your lifetime to be able to actually get close to the Willamette Falls. It is the second largest by volume in the entire United States. It is an amazing site. It is a special place, not just for us, but for all of our uh, tribal members and our native uh, citizens that really want to be part, um, part and parcel and reconnect with that. But that is a development it's going to be a urban development, and we are spurring on that development with this park's money. By putting that access for a viewing platform, we are actually creating that opportunity. And now the Grand Ronde have bought the property for development, so that's, that's great. But I didn't want that to be the only development that we partner with in the entire region for the next 10 to 15 years. So we created a $50 million bucket of money to be able to partner with high density, affordable, transit-oriented development, types of development that will help spur that development, but also protect what we want to protect. So if we have to do habitat restoration, if we have to do uh, a park to make it all livable um, with increased density, then we should, be, we should be a partner in that development. And so it'll be the first time we've married affordable housing and housing goals with our parks goals. And I think that, that you should be very proud of that because there's no one else in the entire United States who has proposed to do that. So that was the second big part of the regional investment strategies. That, by the way, uh, is an extension of an already existing 19 cent per thousand tax, property tax. We did not raise it, we did not lower it, but we extended it. At 19 cent per thousand, it will raise 475 million. So that, that, that is uh, part and parcel, I believe, in line with our mission as Metro to make sure we continue the livability of this region as we grow. The last one, uh, kind of came to us in a, in a roundabout way, being the traffic engineer that I am that loves roundabouts. Um, the, uh, the, the conversation started about four or five years ago with Southwest Corridor and light rail down Barber. How are we gonna pay for that? It's the next light rail, what do we do? Well, fast forward, uh, it wasn't looking good to go to the ballot region wide, it never does for one light rail line, right? <coughs> because it's in one person's, it's in a couple people's backyards, but not the entire region's backyard, so it makes it difficult. Uh, we had a conversation about pairing that up with some highway projects, I-205, I-5 projects. Um, it went a little bit better, but the state did not buy into that uh, conversation. So HB 2017 does not reflect what we had hoped for, which was to get half the money from all those projects um, and then have the region pay for the other half. So TriMet looked at Metro and said, I think it's time, I think it's time that we look at a regional transportation package, not just trying to pay for one project. And as we watch the congestion in the region increase with the population increase and the affordable housing issues, it became all the more apparent that people didn't just want one project or another project, they wanted our transport system to start working again. That means looking at things completely differently. That means you don't go and you say, we're gonna do the following 10 projects. Because if you do the following 10 projects, I guarantee you, having come from the Puget Sound region and trying to work on major mega highway projects, you're moving the congestion around into somebody else's backyard. That's all you're doing. So if that's what we wanna do, and we've never done that as a region, if that's the track we wanna go down, we can continue to go down that. But instead, we said, you know what, let's think differently. If we're gonna to go to the ballot and we're gonna think about how do we actually get from Gresham to Forest Grove, not through one interchange, but actually make the trip from Gresham to Forest Grove, what does that mean? That means we have to pay more attention to the entire 
transportation roadway corridor. So we need to have improvements all the way along for safety, for congestion relief, for accessibility, for all modes. And we need to be able to think about how we get more freight through, but we also need to think about how we get more people through. So we started down this track and we created a task force in January. There are 34 people on that task force. There are elected officials, business folks, um, stakeholders from the transportation community and just thought leaders that we wanted to make sure were part of this. And they have narrowed down 111 separate corridor segments in this region that popped. That's not all of them. These are the ones that popped because they had safety issues, because they weren't moving, because they were congested. So that tells you kind of the state of the system. We're kind of in a state of disrepair in terms of dealing with our system. So we, we had them prioritize these corridors, and they are now down to, and we'll show this. Thank you, Holly. Um, we pulled up off the web this map. And I know it's a little small for you sitting in the back, but what you can see are the uh, green lines should pop out at you. Those are the 13 priority corridors. And there is a set of, excuse me, orange lines underneath um, that are tier two. So they've tiered these into uh, corridors that will be able to uh, get investment and get big benefits from them. So what you don't see on there is I-5 or I-205. And I'll be up front with you. Those are state, that's a state level type of investment. We were more worried about how our region is working than moving trucks from Vancouver, BC to Mexico. And every project on I-5 and I-205 would have sucked all the money out of this list. And we would have no way to get from Gresham to Forest Grove. So we were very specific. We said I-5 and I-205, the state has put some money into Rose Corridor. We've got the I-5 bridge replacement project coming back. We've got an I-205 commitment. Uh, we're gonna need Highway 26, but Highway 26 is part of this. We need, we need as a region to focus on, on, our, on our own backyard, what we control, what we own. So uh, you, you see um, in the top tier, out this way, if you start with the north-south lines on the East County side, you've got 82nd, 122nd, 162nd, uh, is that 181st to 175th? It goes down, it's the C to C, uh, Columbia to Clackamas Corridor. So um, you'll, that, that's quite a bit of grid that needs to be improved in order for this region to move in East County. Then you'll also see Burnside and I guess Powell. So we've got, we've got a good grid of high priority corridors going in order for us to get through and across this region just in East County. In Clackamas County, which you uh, obviously spend time going in and out of uh, besides Multnomah County, um, you've got the Sunrise Corridor, uh, McLaughlin, and that, that's really it, it besides 82nd for Clackamas County right now. They also want to see um, a very specific project done, which is the Oak Grove to Lake Oswego bike ped, hopefully transit bridge. Um, and so they're, they're still working on how to get that in here. But that's where we're at right now. Uh, over the summer, there were local investment teams from each of the three counties that worked on every single one of these corridors, identifying the high priority projects on all of those measures that I just talked about. Uh, and they are presenting them tomorrow night. The projects will be spelled out. Uh, there will be a lot more projects than we will have funds for. So we will need to prioritize those projects. But these are the corridors that we're looking at. Now the tier two corridors are interesting because they also popped. They're also priorities. But they aren't as far along in the needs assessment, which makes them higher risk which means if we're going out to the May ballot, we need a little bit more definitive work done. And so what we're proposing is that we do the projects in these corridors, but we also have a pot of money for planning, which we have really never done in this region. We have never set aside the money to actually implement past a plan. So we're gonna try and figure out how we can get these, proje these, 
long range projects accelerated so that we don't have to wait around and go through what we're going through this time, which was starting whole cloth and it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work. And we're trying to minimize the risk to the region by making sure that the projects that we put into this package are deliverable. And I can tell you, there needs to be financial deliverability, there needs to be technical, and there needs to be political. All three of those have to be met to be able to, to move forward. And so it's a, it's a heavy lift for the region right now. Um, and every single jurisdiction is really working hard. And I gotta say, um, nobody is shrinking from their duties on this one. Everybody is, has recognized the need and has put the time and energy into it and also recognizes what those green lines cost. Let me just give you a range and hold on to your seats. The range that we're looking at for this package would be about seven and a half to $10 billion. And that's just for the top priority corridors. That's how far behind we are. So if you look at other regions across the entire West Coast, Colorado, Utah, um, our neighbors, they have passed much bigger packages and they've passed many more of them. So we're starting from a position uh, this will be our first shot, right? And then we'll be able to move on because what we need to show is success. This region has not seen successful movement in transportation in at least three to four decades. We have to remember how to do this. So we're, we're gonna start at this point and we're gonna move up. I'm excited about the opportunities mm -hmm. that this is gonna provide for our region. Um, I just want you to think about the jobs created from seven and a half to $10 billion. I want you to think about the accessibility of your businesses that they will receive. Uh, if, we can, if we can get this done, it'll, it's sorely needed. And it will also support all of the statewide investments on I-5 and I-205, right? Because they can't handle all the traffic and we can't handle all the traffic. So we need to be part and parcel of the solution. So we're excited to see this move forward and the programs like the planning program, uh, we are, still working with our task force to figure out what those programs essentially would be besides planning. Uh, we've had uh, some discussion around safe routes to school, uh, a pot of money for safety, just pure safety projects that would come up during the extent of this, um, this bond measure so that we could uh, work as quickly as possible to make sure that intersections are safe or a road segment is safer because uh, we don't want to leave those behind. Um, also, we're also looking at um, uh, something like a program that would uh, accelerate the purchase of electrification of the transit vehicles within this region for SMART and TriMet. So it, it's a wide range of topics that are being discussed right now, but it would further advance all of the goals that we have uh, in this region. One of the things I'll just leave with you as well is that we are going to be asking every single one of the, the cities and counties along these corridors to be putting together plans of how affordable housing will also match in to these corridors because we need to get the people who left back into this region because that helps on the transportation side and also make sure that we ha can house every worker which we can't do right now so we're going to we're going to be asking for everybody to to think about how to do that as well so with that i'm going to encourage you uh this fall to follow this process, uh, make sure, as I'm sure your city councilors are, uh, making sure that their projects are included in this, um, that are forward thinking, how do we get some planning money for, pro for projects that are not quite ready, and also to make sure that uh, as we go forward, the revenue sources are things that you're gonna feel comfortable with. Because what we do know is that people are chomping at the bit in this region to get some shit done, right? And it's time. So we're, we're ready, we're poised to make that happen with your help, and um, as we come to the conclusion of this next May, uh, hopefully it'll be something that the Chamber can support. So thank you. So will you take some questions? Oh, yes. So first question, um, <laughs> while the rest of you are pondering what your question is, you said seven and a half to $10 billion mm -hmm. over the course of 
you know, whatever time frame. Mm -hmm. Have you guys started to work down how much it'll be per person or per property, mm -hmm. or well, what is that number? That comes actually next. Um, we've got Eco Northwest working on a study to uh, show us the revenue sources um, that we have and the ones that we might want to ask for, because uh, we uh, obviously, like any other jurisdiction, need to have enabling legislation from the state in order to raise taxes. Um, so right now, we know what we do have, and we have a vehicle registration fee that we can raise. That, if you raise it to the maximum of $56, this is just so you have an understanding of how much we need. Um, we need three to four hundred million per year to pay off a seven and a half to ten billion dollar uh, bond measure. The vehicle registration fee in this region would raise around sixty million. So that that leaves quite a gap. Uh, we can do an income tax, we can do a property tax, and we can do a payroll tax. But there are, all three of those are fraught with issues. I, myself, and I think every single person on the council uh, agrees that property tax should not be on the table. We will look at how much it can raise, though, so that we have that information and we can vet that with all of you. There, there is a lot of reasons not to go to property tax. One is that it's overused. Second is that transportation is a utility. It should be treated as a utility, and it should not go after general fund money. So I think we need to be very specific and uh, think kind of out of the box in order to come up with that gap. Yeah, my next question, I think you just answered it, is with, with rent control that went in, if you would raise the property tax on an, on an owner that has a building that rents, yeah. you can't pass it on to the to the person that lives in that mm -hmm. house under the rent control yep. issue that passed. So, but you, you did answer the question, you're steering away from the property tax, and if you work, there's potential that you'd be an income tax, a higher income I, tax. No, I, I, no. honestly, I don't know how we get to income tax or payroll tax. Okay. Because they're both politically fraught as well for different reasons. Yeah. And I think the, the business community would weigh in on both of those. But we'll, we'll look at them. We'll figure out what different scenarios look like. We'll have that conversation with you. Well, I applaud you for being the visionary, but I wish I could have been on that committee. My name was put forward and you rejected me. Rejected. Maybe it's because I'm in Sandy, you know, like I don't drive, I don't bike, I'm not sure. So does anybody have a question that they would like to ask? Oh, Warner. So I'll start with um, one of about 12. <laughs> um, so we've got, multiple jurisdictions obviously involved in transportation yeah. yeah and the overlays are always of concern yeah so we got the state we got the county we got metro we've got the cities what is being done to make sure that let's say the city of portland pdot is consistent with whatever this plan is in their implementation of things and part of the reason why i ask that is because there are things going on in my area that seem to be totally inconsistent with that. You talked about 122nd and 162nd. Um, we didn't talk about, and you talked about Burnside, and you talked about um, Powell mm -hmm. <coughs> divisions involved in part of that too. But I'm watching um, currently as we sit here, Gleason between 162nd and 124th being carved up um, and um, narrowed down to two lanes with all kinds of parking to the right and bicycle lanes and um, the resulting um, congestion of that. And when I talked with one of the citizens advisory people who had been on the citizens advisory council for that particular project, he advised me that he finally just said, I'm out of here. You people have already got an agenda. You're not at all interested in what the citizens have to say about this project. You're all about green energy and limiting um, vehicular traffic, and that's what you're doing. So how does all of that interface? That's a good question. Aside so, from my political statement. So, yeah, so, um, you know, Metro is, is the coordinator, the facilitator, and what you will see coming out of the conversations tomorrow night are the projects, right, the specific projects within each corridor. 
even I don't know what those are yet. Um, so it'll it'll be um, it'll be interesting to see what's being proposed. And I would encourage you to look within the city of Portland at their proposed projects on these corridors uh, to answer your specific question. I think on the 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 hundred thousand foot level, not the square foot level, um, we. We are interested in making sure that we can move as many people as we possibly can within the region and as much freight as we can within the region. So we, there are specific performance metrics that we have set up that they will have to show that their corridors are actually doing well on. So I would, I would also look to those performance metrics. Now, on the back side of all this, Metro will play a much bigger role on oversight of the actual project delivery. And that's where we're weighing in quite heavily right now, is to make sure that we've reduced as much risk as we possibly can within each and every jurisdiction's projects so that it is deliverable and it is deliverable at budget, because we will not be paying for cost overruns. You heard it here. <laughs> Another question, Lila? Um, one question I have, how many acres total does Metro own at this point? In the parks, uh, from the parks uh, bond measure, 17,000 acres. Okay, where did the money come from that was used to buy that? Was that put on a bond specifically to yeah. buy new acreage? Yes. Yeah, so we've had two prior bond measures. This will be the third. Okay. A next question. <clears throat> Sorry. No, Somebody you're great. wants it. Yell. Um, it was my understanding on the last bond that went through that there were to be improvements to I-5 heading into Seattle, but so far we've seen nothing happen. There was a big hullabaloo that, yes, we were going to put it in, and then there were some people that, no, they didn't want to put in especially through the Rose Quarter, and we haven't seen anything. So what happened to our monies for that? Mm -hmm. Are they still sitting there and we're going to do it? The next question I oh, have. Stop there. <laughs> that could take all day. That's a PhD thesis right there. Um, so what, what I can tell you on the I-5 bridge replacement program, which is the old Columbia River crossing project, is that um, I, I got to work on that project from a Clackamas County commissioner point of view and as the secretary of the DOT for Washington State. I had to close the project because the Washington State legislature did not fund in their budget the next phase. They shut it down because they had two issues. They had an issue with tolling and they had an issue with light rail. So $180 million was spent by the two states, about $90 million a piece, to get us through an environmental impact statement that allows us to go to construction. That environmental impact statement is still there, and it's still valid for a very short period of time. <laughs> Com coming, coming up, um, we also uh, need to show progress, or we owe the feds back some of that $180 million. So uh, Washington State just recently put $35 million with, under the governor's request to reopen the project office through the Washington side of that project to restart and get us to construction. So Oregon is, is coming along and trying to figure out, so what are their next steps now? So it's a, state, it's a statewide project, right? So the, the region is just one of the stakeholders in it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, then on to your map. I see you're going to be improving traffic flow, but what are you doing? Are you putting all light rail through there? Are you widening the roads? Are we building double high? What I, I couldn't get any resolution from my mind yeah. out of what you're doing. So that's because I didn't tell you, um, because I don't know. So the, over the summer, all of the uh, counties have had teams working to basically come up with the projects that would get better traffic flow, better transit flow, better safety, and better um, overall economic uh, accessibility. Um, and so they will have those projects as of tomorrow night. We'll know specifically what projects they're thinking about doing to be able to deal with the entirety of the corridor. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Councillor Widmark. Thank you. Um, for looking at this uh, proposal that will be unveiled tomorrow, how much state and federal money is included in that, or is that completely Zero. off the table? Zero. So none of this competes for any of the federal funding or state funding? Be because it's there, not federal highways, is that part of it, or? Um, first of all, there's uh, federal uh, transportation money is going the way of other infrastructure money, which is the way of the dodo at this okay. point, right? Um, so the amount of money that we have is going into maintenance for federal money. We can, if the, if, if Congress comes back and says that they're looking at specific types of projects with earmarks or earmarks again, then we might be able to compete for more projects, but we can't depend on that to go to a right. bond measure. Okay. Um, so folks have asked me, well, why didn't you include congestion pricing or tolling in this? Because we, we as Metro are not enabled to do either. So until, we're, until we can actually do it, and there's an actual project that's pulling in actual money and we know how much it would be, we can't bond against it. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, uh, one other follow-up question kind of goes off what Warner Allen was talking about in regards to where Portland has you know narrowed so many streets. I'll use Division as an example, mm -hmm. and you know it seems to create more congestion. Here you are trying to move people through, and I know Portland has her own plan. They have their own funding, everything else. How does that mirror into what we want to do, what you want to do for the region, which I wholeheartedly support? Um, I just, it's just, I'm just curious from that standpoint. You know, I think on the, uh, again, I don't know what the specific projects are going to be. Um, we'll, we'll know and we'll be able to get that information to everybody. Um, but there, there is a uh, point at which uh, the region has to deal with travel demand management, and so does the city of Portland. Right, because there's no way for them to basically put out enough capacity. So when they say they're trying to, um, they're narrowing the streets and they're trying to get other modes and trying to make things more safe, they're also trying to move more people. So when you're, when you're, you're tr it's a different performance metric of vehicles versus people, right? Because if you have one person per vehicle, but you could have 20 in the bus or 45 um, during peak hour, you're moving more people in during that peak hour. So I, I would just say they're trying to meet the same performance metrics every single one of us are trying to meet, but they have more constraints on what they can do. And they're, they are, yes, experimenting with different things, and some of them are going to work and some of them aren't. But it, it's not the region's... Um, we're looking for as practical a solution on the ground that we can get for the cheapest amount of money to move the most number of people at peak hour that we can find. That should be our goal, to utilize what we have more efficiently and then maximize whatever we put out there that's new. Yeah. Councillor Eccles has a question. Thank you, and thank you, President Peterson. I, I have the honor and, and sometime the bur burden of serving on the task yes, force. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it you is. <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm on the task force, oh, yeah. not the LIT. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's been a, it's been a very thorough, very um, comprehensive, and really at a really breakneck speed to get to where we're at. Um, so just a comment, and then and then a question. Um, the the corridors that were brought up as being in East County, there's a, there's a history to those. Those didn't come out of nowhere. Those yeah. um, those that were originally um, prioritized by the city council through extensive amount of work that staff has been doing over the years, and based on a lot of data and um, a lot of citizen input, um, and um, we've been. It, as task force men members, we're responsible to think regionally. Um, so, you know, we're supporting everywhere across the region. Um, but, the, but, at, and conversely, or at least on the same side, is that we have a lot of support across the region for the, the priorities that we have identified in our community. Mm -hmm. We had one meeting where someone tried to get rid of one of our priorities, and it, 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 yeah, I know. <laughs> I wrote that person's name now. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, 
died for a second, but because people were really surprised. I think Dean was there that night. I can't remember. Probably <laughs> looked at each other. But anyway, so um, President Peterson, you talk a little bit about maybe seven and a half to ten billion dollars. Is that specific to um, projects, or we? You've also talked about programs. Is that? like the safe routes to school? It's that, both. It's, it's both. It's the combination of both. That's heavily weighted towards the project side. But what we'd be looking for is a stream of money to be able to do planning outside of the bonding. Jerry Hinton, Councillor Jerry Hinton has a question. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. You've, you've got some pretty good uh, hardball questions so far. I'll ch change gears just a little bit. Uh, on the affordable housing bond, yeah. you had mentioned um, once uh, residents are moved in, that they're allowed to stay there till they're stabilized. And this is the first time I've heard that. What's your criteria for stabilization? How long do you think they'll will be given them before people on this this very, very, very long waiting list will be able to have access to those resources? That's different for each of it. Having been chair of Clackamas County, I would just say it's different for every single one of the housing authorities and every single one of the, um, the projects, depending on who they're serving. Um, it, it could be six months for a family of five because they, they, their rent got jacked up and they had to move out and they've been couch surfing, right? It could just be six months. Um, but for others, it, it could be longer. Um, there's a project that we approved down in Gladstone. Um, it, it's a question I've had for a very long time and uh, OPB just covered it and that is the, the single rooms. We're, that it was it, it was a craze to not have people coming off the street go into basically single rooms for a very long time. Uh, when you think about McMinimums way back when, out here in Troutdale, um, right? That was that was a place for young men to go during the depression, and they each got their own room and they had shared facilities. Uh, we're going back to that, and so there's a uh, facility that the state had uh, basically abandoned, had let go. They weren't going to use it in Gladstone um, for um, uh, foster kids. I think it was for foster kids. And uh, single rooms, shared facilities, and they had closed that. And Gladstone is going to, Clackamas County with Gladstone, they're going to reopen that. That's part of the, the first 339 units. So we'll be able to get people off the street and into those. But depending on their needs, it could be a short time, it could be a long time. So you've been given some really hard questions. I'll give you an easy one. Ducks or beavers? Badgers. I'm nonpartisan in this okay. state. <laughs> Not fair. You could have said Vikings, and that would have been appropriate. Um, uh, Warner has another question. Is that OK? Uh-huh. You're not going to ask yours? Oh, you did. So <laughs> talking about the low-income housing, and, and you'd said you know part of that housing is very, very low. Um, income units for folks who are just coming off the streets. Who manages that? Who provides for the resources for those people? I mean, we've got all kinds of nonprofits out here who provide that kind of mm -hmm. um, stuff, but it seems to me that there's just a hodgepodge of um, resources or lack of resources to provide success for those people moving on. Yeah, I would say that the entire system has basically collapsed over the years, right? And so a lot of nonprofits have come into that area to deal with the services. Um, the problem is that being homeless means you don't have a house. If you don't have a house, your other issues become greater. So to get rid of homelessness, we need housing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the stabilization of the individual um, and the services that we call wraparound services. Um, Clackamas County, some of those wraparound services were provided directly because we had federal, we had state money, and even though it wasn't sufficient, um, we were able to do that to at least a population. Um, that's where the nonprofits kind of step in. But all of the affordable housing in this region through our, um, our three housing authorities, it's all a public-private pu partnership, and it's almost always done. We, hardly any of them actually own the, 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 the units at the end. That's why we had to get the state constitution changed. And part of that is the cost of delivery. Um, we needed to bring down the cost of delivery so we were able to use these geo bonds for public-private partnership. So it, it is a hodgepodge, and, and there's, until there's enough funding from the feds, which are not 
they're not giving us the money that we need, both on the social services as well as the housing side anymore, um, and the state. Then the counties who provide most of those wraparound services in conjunction with the nonprofits will continue to struggle. So there is a, uh, a, some work afoot to talk about what those wraparound services needs are, at least in the next five to 10 years, and to uh, basically go out to the ballot, um, either Multnomah County or region-wide. No, it's it's 100% units. It's up to the counties and the state to, to and the feds to f do the wraparound service portion. But we didn't put anything out that the counties didn't say that they could do or would be able to do. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Um, on a different note, it's really nice to hear that you love roundabouts. I do. I love roundabouts. I was can you can you do something to make the Americans just accept this? <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. If, if you don't mind me going just a bit astray, um, uh, when you get, when you enter into an intersection, how many points of conflict where you could potentially die do you think there are in that intersection? Think of all of the different ways that you're making a turning movement cross traffic. There are 64. There are 64 points in which you could get hit head on. You could get hit from behind. You could get hit T-boned. All of those are serious injury acts, uh, collisions, serious injury or fatal, depending on how high speed you're going through that. A roundabout has four points of conflict. They're low speed and they're side swipes. Nobody dies in a roundabout. Just from that statistic alone, we should all be asking for more roundabouts. Um, it, it, is, it is also a huge maintenance issue to have signals everywhere. It is expensive. It is not a, a cheap thing to put in a new signal, and it's not a cheap thing to maintain them. And then you get congestion from them. A, a roundabout actually reduces congestion along a corridor. So it, it, it yes. 85% of people surveyed before a roundabout go in hate them. 85% afterwards love them. So we've got a ways to go. WashDOT, while I was there, um, I knew I was going to love working at WashDOT because while I was here working in this region, Washington State was moving ahead with roundabouts. Um, and they uh, did it in, in a way that both businesses and citizens really loved is they set up the proposed roundabout in a parking lot and then they let people test it. So if you had farm equipment and you're like, that's not gonna work, okay, let's test it. And maybe it didn't. And they would change the design on the spot to accommodate that vehicle. Because roundabouts are specifically designed for every context. You have to be, you have to think a lot more as an engineer to get it right. And you have to think more as a driver to get it right, right? But you're not going to die. <laughs> so I think right there, <clears throat> that's my last word. <laughs> Roundabouts are but much it's better. Not, <laughs> it's not the last question. Okay. Dean? So I was just sitting here thinking, Lynn, that uh, you're talking November 2020, without knowing how exactly it might be paid for, something on the order of $10 billion the same time in the region, it seems to me, people always aim for those elections. So you have a potential school bond in Portland of $500 million. One billion. Billion. At, um, under property tax. Uh, you reminded, somebody reminded me here that there's also consideration, and maybe you just said it too, of a, of a uh, homelessness support type of measure mm -hmm. region-wide. The Multnomah County Library is thinking about a capital measure at that time. The city of Portland is talking about renewing their gas tax. In May. Most of those are in May. Most of those are in May. Mm -hmm. All of that, though, even yeah. whatever go, goes in that time, it seems to me you're going to have an issue with people going, how much can they support? And yep. is there any sort of communication across these various measures to say, maybe we ought to line these up? Is there any communication with people who are talking about these things? Um, what I can tell you is yes. I mean, I'm talking to a lot of those folks. Um, I think what we find, though, is that region-wide, the elected officials in this region are ready for a transportation package. The citizens are ready for a transportation package. They're ready to go big. They're ready to go bold. And when they're surveyed, this is what they're saying. 
They will support schools and they will support transportation. They will support a lot of this stuff. Um, people individually vote for the measure itself. They don't weigh between them. If they're for schools, they're gonna be for schools. If they're for schools and they want transportation, they're gonna go for both. Um, but I do think that we need to be cognizant of where we're going for the money. Another question? I have a question, um, and it goes back to me whining about not being on a committee. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, all on, in all fairness, when whoever's in the room gets to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it Metro's policy to make sure that every sector is at the table, that someone from public is at the table, somebody from utility is at the table, somebody from business is, out to, is at the table, all the way through, instead of there being a lot of elected or a lot of yeah. employees or a lot of something, so that every voice truly is heard at the table and you don't, I, I'm not gonna say stack the deck in a bad way, right. but We've both been on committees yeah. and you look around the room and everybody's being paid by a public agency except for the right. lone business person. Yeah. So is there some kind of a policy or yes. would you consider that? Or Well, I don't think it's a written policy, but it is, um, I'm, I'm pretty amazed um, at the inclusivity of Metro. Uh, the region is so diverse. Um, but we do, on that task force, the 34 member task force that's looking at this, a quarter are elected, a quarter. A quarter are business, a quarter are um, uh, thought leaders, and a quarter are uh, transportation specific stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So we have a really good mix and from um, other um, comments I've received on the business end, they are very pleased with the business voices at the table. So what I also need to uh, let you know is that we are on the cutting edge of making sure that people who don't normally get a voice at any table are actually included at tables underneath all of what you've seen going on, whether it be parks or affordable housing or transportation. <clears throat> and in some cases, we have to pay people to be there because they don't have, they don't have the capability to be there unless they're paid. They can't take time off. They can't pay for daycare, but we need their voices at the table so that we hear them. So we have gone much further into the space than um, I had originally even thought uh, coming in. And so I'm very pleased with the inclusivity. It means that there's a lot of voices. There are a lot of voices, and there's a lot of voices that um, haven't been heard before, and they're new perspectives, and it's exciting, but it's also a little overwhelming. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank for you, that. everybody. Thanks for your so, attention. No last questions? No follow up? Okay. Lynn, thank you for being here again. We appreciate that so much. And I am still whining about not getting to be on the committee. And you wouldn't have had to pay me, so there we go. Um, I want to thank again our sponsors for uh, today's event, Columbia Bank, Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. Now that you've heard her, you can hear her again over and over and over and over if you get, you, um, get the, re the replay schedule out at the table. October and November business luncheons are going to be about cybersecurity. And it's going to come in two parts. October is going to be about credit card theft. And you're going to get to hear my personal business story as well as an expert who does things around the world with credit cards. Part two is ransom security. We've heard about how rampant that is, how scary it is not just with cities, but they are ransom businesses too, and how, do, how you deal with it. So it's a two-part series, and exactly one month from today is our business summit. Lessons from the Mouse House, one month from today's date, not today's day. Um, lessons from the Mouse House with Pete Blank from Disney University. You can register online. Um, seats are going fast. And we've titled this summit, Beyond Business as Usual, Disney's Approach to Business Excellence. Pete Blank is a national speaker. He's had 13 years at Disney and 12 years in local government. He manages over 750 people in Birmingham. He has uh, 25 years of stories, ideas, and experiences to help us through, to help us be the best managers, supervisors, employees, and leaders that we can be. 
and he does all this with humor. I wouldn't invite somebody if there wasn't some humor to it. He's going to join us for the Business Summit, and you can reserve a table today. And if you register today, today only, it's a special today. If you register today, we get you a free book, one of his free books, not just any free book, but one of his. So pick up your replay schedule. Thank your neighbor beside you for joining you for lunch. See you next month. <laughs>